So we've been looking at this series of messages uh, called Follow Me. And uh, the first one was the call. We, we examined the call of what it means to follow Jesus and the importance of repentance in following Jesus and believing in Jesus. And then last week, we examined those passages that talk about the cost associated with it, taking up the cross, how the, Jesus separates those uh, even within a family. And this week, I, I have to say, I was... Uh, I had conversations, many of you, that passage of scripture and that message struck home as you shared stories with me of how your following Jesus and belief in the gospel has affected the closest earthly relationships that you have and the divisions that occur simply because you have given your allegiance to Christ. Well, this morning, I want us to look at this idea that Jesus gives us that to follow him, the the best and the fullest expression of following him is not found as isolated individuals, but instead within the context of biblical community. As a nation, we are experiencing a crisis in community and an epidemic of loneliness among uh, Americans. A study was done and an article was written back in May of this year on the, in the New York Times. And the title of it borrowed from the uh, song of my uh, younger days, uh, All the Lonely People. All the lonely people. Anyway, I won't sing it for you. This is what it said. It said the suicide rate for Americans, 35 to 54, that, that age range strikes home to me because I fall in that range. I wish I could say it was a 35, but I was closer to, but it's actually the 54 that I'm closer to. Uh, that age range, suicide has increased nearly 30% between 1999 and 2000. This next line really caught my attention because I'm, about, I'm getting close to 50. For men in their 50s, it rose nearly 50% in that 11-year time frame. 50% increase among men. More Americans now die of suicide than in car accidents, and gun suicides are almost twice as common as gun homicides. This trend is striking without necessarily being surprising. At the University of Virginia, sociologist Brad Wilcox pointed out recently there's a strong link between suicide and weakened social ties. People, and especially men, become more likely to kill themselves when they get disconnected from society's core institutions such as marriage, uh, religion, and uh, civic organizations, or when their economic prospects take a dive. That's exactly what we've seen happen lately among the middle-aged male population whose suicide rates have climbed the fastest. A retreat from family obligations, from civic and religious participation, and from full-time paying work. The hard question facing 21st century America is whether this retreat from community can reverse itself or whether an aging society dealing with structural unemployment and declining birth and marriage rates is simply destined to leave more people disconnected, anxious, and alone. Right now, the pessimistic scenario seems more plausible. In an essay for the New Republic about the consequences of loneliness for public health, Judah Shulevitz reports that one in three Americans, 33% of Americans over 45, identify themselves as chronically lonely, up from just one in five or 20% a decade ago. With baby boomers reaching a retirement age at a rate of 10,000 a day, she notes, the number of lonely Americans will surely spike. The article goes on to say that all of the efforts that people are, are taking to try and address this deep, restless, abiding loneliness is failing to deliver on what was hoped. Uh, social media, Facebook, uh, online chatting, online relationships, all of these different mechanisms that people are looking to in order to find community fall short of delivering what is hoped for. It's a, it's a shallow substitute for real community. You know, as I see people and interact with people, they try to cope with this loneliness in a variety of ways. Uh, for many people, they turn to drugs or they turn to alcohol or they turn to a new relationship, a new spouse, a new girlfriend, a new boyfriend, a new toy, a new hobby, a new recreational outlet, uh, a new career, a new pet. I mean, any number of things people turn to, and it's really an effort to address this underlying loneliness that is in their lives. This happens for those who are outside the church and those who are inside the church. 
Just because you're part of a church doesn't mean that you will no longer live a disconnected, fragmented, lonely life. I have been in small groups and not had community and connectedness. Just, it's not a guarantee that just because you're in a small group or just because you're in a church that you will not face this type of fragmentation. Certainly, though, this is not Jesus' plan for us. This is not our Creator's plan for us. Uh, Jesus passionately desires for us to live in biblical community because Jesus has experienced perfect, infinite, eternal community. He understands the importance of it. Uh, Jesus, God the Son, God the Father, God the Spirit have lived an infinite community. The only time that community has been broken was when Jesus was on the cross taking our sins upon him. At that moment in time, Jesus experienced the greatest agony he could experience because the community that he had enjoyed for all of eternity with God the Father and God the Spirit was severed as he took upon us the weight of our sin. And my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was the result of the severance of that community. We were created for community. We were designed, it is inherent within our uh, DNA, our bodies to crave community. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter two that God says, let us go down and make man in our image. In the creation account of when we were, when humanity was created, the Godhead, one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, let us go down and make man in our image. When we were created in the image of that Godhead, we were created craving and needing community. It's inherent in our design. So it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus prays that we would live in that type of oneness. Biblical community, what is that? It, it basically means that we follow Jesus together. Rather than following Jesus as individuals or living on our, an island, doing whatever it is that we want to do, disconnected from others, we are following Jesus in, a, in, a, in some type of a, of a fellowship uh, environment and community. The, the simplest definition I know of biblical community is followers of Jesus being Jesus to one another. Write that down. <laughs> followers of Jesus being Jesus to one another. It's biblical community. Okay. It is together. And Jesus is passionate about this. He prays for it. It's important. You see that importance in John chapter 17. You see that biblical community uh, when, when I am engaged and living in biblical community, I bring more glory to God in that context than I do when I am disconnected from biblical community. In other words, we glorifies Jesus more than me. He says in verse 9, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them, plural, through the corporate, the community. Why is that? Well, I think at least at, on one level, I know in my own life, that when I am disconnected from community, I am a less effective follower of Jesus Christ. I am more susceptible to sin. I am more susceptible to following the idolatries of my own heart. I am, own, I am more susceptible from, from keeping my mouth shut and opposing evil or keeping my mouth shut and being a, an advocate for the gospel to those who need it. Uh, when I am disconnected from community, I more and more become my own God, following my own agenda. I'm just simply a less effective follower of Jesus Christ when I'm disconnected from biblical community. Thus, I bring less glory to Jesus when I'm disconnected. We, when me, when I am part of we, I bring more glory to Jesus. We brings more glory than me. We need community. Jesus is passionate about this. So passionate that in verse 20, he, that's just a stupendous verse. 
uh, when, when, I, when I first, when this verse really popped off the page at me, it changed my perspective on biblical community completely. Uh, I had had a, an associate pastor in the church I was at, and I was, a, I was, a, a, I was just a, a member of the church. I was a teacher. I taught Sunday school classes. And I had an associate pastor, much like Jonathan, who was always after me to, to get into biblical community and to even think about leading a small group in the church. And I kept, you know, I just kept giving it the stiff arm because when I heard a small group, what I heard when he said small group, you need to get into a small group, I heard through the filter of my mind, Jerry, you need to get in touch with your feminine side. That's what I heard, okay? In other words, he wanted to put me into something where I was gonna have to be touchy-feely and we're gonna do group hugs and, you know, uh, it's just, yeah, you know, it's group therapy. And I wanted nothing to do with that, okay? Just absolutely nothing. And I just stiff-armed him. Finally, he bribed me. He took me up to Chicago to a, a, a seminar and a workshops and things. And well, I don't even remember who the speaker was, but he was speaking from John chapter 17 and just in a passing reference at verse 20, uh, it, it just went, wow. Understand the significance of verse 20. Uh, uh, from verses 9 to 19, you know, literally Jesus is praying for those 11 disciples that are with him, the apostles. Okay, Judas has left to betray Jesus. And Jesus is praying for Peter and James and John. And, and now, of course, by extension and application, we're included in that prayer. But in verse 20, he goes further, look at it. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message. So in other words, I'm not just praying for these 11 men. I'm praying for all of those people who will come after them, who will become believers and follow me because of the message that they're gonna spread around the world. I wanna pray for Keith Perry. I'm praying for Linda. I'm praying for Ev. I'm praying for April. I'm praying for Jerry. I'm praying for those who will follow after. In the upper room, in his last day, hours on earth, last 24 hours of his life, Jesus prayed for me. And he prayed for you. And it isn't it interesting what he didn't pray for? He didn't pray. Father, make them passionate, effective soul winners. Father, make them holy so that no one is able to ever besmirch my reputation through their lives. Father, through them, extend the kingdom around the world. Make the church prominent and dominant. Father, keep them from having church divisions and splits and all of that. Instead, he says, I pray that they would be one as we are one. They would experience that eternal community that we have, oneness, oneness. That's his request. That's his passionate desire for you. That you would follow him within the context of biblical community. Why? Why does he pray for that? Why? I think the, the, the evidence is in the, the rest of this passage because of what biblical community brings us. So many of those things I mentioned, why didn't he pray for this or that? It's because when you are in biblical community, those things are natural outworkings of biblical community. Look at the first one. And by the way, to help you maybe understand it, I decided to get a little visual this morning. And so uh, I have for you a picture of a fort. And we're going to have six pictures that help you understand the benefits of biblical community. I, I had a great dad. And one of the things that I loved about my dad that my principals and teachers didn't care about, but that's okay, was he was not averse at all to letting me skip school. 
And he, he traveled throughout Florida and Georgia as an as a area manager for a, a company, a salesman. And if he was going to some place that he thought I would find interesting or there was something there that I would like, he would say, you know what, let's just ditch school tomorrow and you come with me. It's great. You know, it's great. And yes, Ken, I've done the same thing for my son Jacob. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. We've gone fishing, and we've gone to Disney, and it's just going to continue. So, all right. And uh, one of the things that I really liked was forts. I was a kid, you know, up, up elementary school. I mean, I've been to St. Augustine Fort. I used to know those rangers by name. You know, I went there so much on Fridays. We'd skip school on Fridays and go to Fort. This is Fort Christmas here in Florida. It's a neat fort. It's a cool fort. I love forts. And I think the reason why I love forts is because I love Saturdays as a kid. Love Saturdays. They were awesome. It's the only day of the week worth watching TV when you were a kid, right? Except for the five to six o'clock hour when Star Trek came on Monday to Friday. There was nothing on TV at any good, you know, because you only had three stations except for Saturdays. You lived, guys, remember this? You lived for Saturdays. Had a hard time getting up early Monday to Friday, but Saturdays, 6.30, you're up sitting, you know, in contorted positions because the cartoons started, Right? And you watched cartoons all morning and, you know, finished up around noon with the Bugs Buddy Roadrunner hour. And then the good stuff really even started. You know, the riflemen, you know. You know, and then the westerns would come on. And I loved westerns. I watched all the westerns. If it came on, it was a western. I watched it. If it was John Wayne, I love John. I've seen every John Wayne western made all the way back to the black and white ones. And I've seen them multiple times. Love John Wayne. Okay. We need more John Waynes. Yeah, amen. That gets an amen. Come on. Come on. <laughs> right? I mean, Glenn Ford, Randolph Scott, even Audie Murphy. I didn't really like Audie Murphy Westerns, but I had to respect him because he was a war hero, okay? So I even watched the Audie Murphy Westerns, and I loved Westerns. I loved it when, you know, the, the Indians were chasing the cavalry, and they're running from the Indians, and where are they headed? They're headed to the fort, Right? And they would get inside the fort just in time, and the doors would close, and, they would, and then the battle would begin. I love, I love forts. Forts represent something, don't they? I mean, the settlers, when there was an attack, what did they do? They ran to the fort. Why did they go to the fort? Protection. Yes, protection. Verse 14, I have given them your world, word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. We live in a hostile environment. As Christians, we are behind enemy lines. Wake up. We're at war. It's a spiritual war. And it expresses itself in a number of ways within our culture. But there is a war going on. It's a war of ideologies, a war of spiritual dimension. We're at war. And we are hated by those who hate Jesus. All I have is, excuse me, uh, verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one. Isn't it interesting that, that the evil one is going to attack us, and one of the areas that he's going to attack us is in the area of biblical community. He will tempt and he will try to do whatever he can to induce you to disengage or to never engage in biblical community. He'll throw job situations. He'll throw sports He'll throw your children. He'll throw a, a bad experience in a group. No, whatever it is, he'll throw it in your path to induce you to disengage from biblical community. Why? Well, I think all we have to do is look to nature. You get an idea of why Satan wants to disconnect us from biblical community. But one zebra is about to violate the first rule of the safari. Always stay with the group. for the typical death blow, crushing the windpipe. I cut it off before the gory stuff. What does the Bible say? Satan is like 
a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Look, you don't want to be the zebra. (laughs) And when you're disconnected from the biblical community, you are easy pickings. The enemy is after you. Second picture, how about a school? What what happens at school? You're educated, you learn. The Bible tells us in verse 16, Jesus says, they are not of the world. We started out in the world, messed up, sinners, estranged from God. But now we've come into this new community, this new relationship with Christ. Sanctify them by the truth. That word sanctify comes from the Greek word agiazo. It means to be set apart, to be made holy, to be consecrated in such a way that you are made usable for the master. Sanctify them, make them usable. Set them apart and make them holy. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. See, biblical community is important because this is the context in which we are supposed to learn the truth of God, where our knowledge and our understanding of God grows and deepens. We come together and we study the Bible. Biblical community is not biblical community if the word of God does not play a central component in that time together. The word isn't there and you're not studying the word of God, then you just have a social club. You have a Christian social club. And there's a place for Christian social clubs, but don't confuse that with biblical community. And something wonderful happens when Christians get together and they study the Bible together. I find that and have found that when you study the scriptures with a people who are on a continuum of spiritual maturation and we discuss a passage of scripture and as that passage of scripture intersects with my life, it will intersect in a particular way, but somebody who is further down the spiritual journey, it intersects with their life in a different way. The application of that scriptural principle and truth. And, and as we discuss it, It helps me to hear how that scriptural truth intersects with their life. It it, it enriches my life to see how it affects other people's lives. And you get a a more full-orbed understanding of the scriptural truth. What it does is it helps us to have a a more developed, fleshed-out understanding of who we are in Christ. When we learn who we are in Christ, and we learn the word of God together, we're stronger, we're better educated, we have a better understanding and knowledge of God. Third picture. This one should resonate because it's January. How many of you made some type of New Year's resolution that centered on either diet slash lose weight and or exercise? Raise your hand. Come on. All right. I either got a bunch of liars in here or a bunch of cynics. I've tried it for decades. I've lost. I'm not doing it anymore. Okay. <laughs> One, two. Uh, now, now let's be done. How many of you have already broken that New Year's resolution? Raise your hand. I won't ask that. Okay. We, 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 New Year's tends to be a time of where we think about our health, our physical health, right? And in biblical community, in one respect, it's some, similar to a health club. You know, you go into a health club together uh, with, you have a trainer or you get into a class, you do CrossFit. When you're in CrossFit, you you do it as a group of people. Why? Why do you go to Zumba, Janie? And why don't you do Zumba by yourself? Why don't you lift weights just by yourself? Why don't you, I mean, why do you get involved in a group? Why do you have a trainer at a health club? because they encourage you. They they encourage you to to do the hard work that's necessary to reach the goal. They provide support, moral support. They they equip you and help you to to be able to do what it is that you need to do and so that you can have the life that you want to have. Tyler and I have been working out now since February of last year, three times a week. And we were talking just the other day about Larry Marshall. Larry's in here somewhere. And uh, you know what? I want to be Larry Marshall when I am his age. I mean, that guy is like the Energizer Bunny. And and so Kat and I were guessing his age, and uh, we were way off. 
I'm not going to tell you how old he is. We thought he was much younger than what he actually is. Because he works guys who are much younger than him into the ground. And, and so we, we decided a year ago, we're never going to be like that. We're never going to be there if we don't start now taking care of our bodies and exercising and doing all these different things. We need that encouragement. So we have a trainer. Because if I don't have a trainer, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to sleep in. Or I'm going to ditch that thing. I need that trainer. I don't like paying the money. But I need it. Why? I need the accountability. I need somebody helping me and encouraging me and pushing them along. I need it. Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus was set apart specifically to accomplish a mission, the mission of redemption, provide salvation for us, to take care of our sins. And Jesus, in turn, has set us apart for that same mission. We carry the message of reconciliation, the good news, the gospel. We have an objective. We have a mission. We, we aren't supposed to come together and just grow fat and sassy. We, we experience biblical community in order to, to grow deep and to grow strong, to grow stronger in our understanding of who we are in Christ and the knowledge of God's word, not so we can sit, but so we can go. We grow in order to go. We grow in order to do. Part of biblical community is doing, working for the kingdom, carrying the message of Christ to those who need it and doing it in a an environment of mutual support. I, one of the things I love about our journey groups is that in those journey groups weekly, we are exhorting one another. We're encouraging one another to live on mission for Jesus Christ. We're learning how to share our faith. And then we're targeting people who we, we love and we're praying for them and we're seeing, God, how can you use me to plant seeds of the gospel and encourage them to embrace Christ. And then we hold each other accountable for it. That's biblical community. It's like a health club where you have goals and you have objectives and you have people who encourage you and you grow stronger together. And then you go out and you do the mission. It's biblical community. Another picture, one that I think the only one that I know of really in Florida is you know, on the Gulf Coast and down the Keys, lighthouses right? A lighthouse. Verse 21, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. Christians who find biblical community, they find power, they find their existence in Christ, and they end up enjoying their union with, with Christ within the context of biblical community. And in that context, they become more effective witnesses. Biblical community itself, Christians doing life together, have a powerful impact on those who don't know Christ. I've seen this in my own personal life. As biblical community has come in support of Catherine and I at different stages of life crises with maybe MJ or something else that was going on, and the, the, our biblical community coming and supporting us, neighbors saying, who are all those people coming to your house with food? The first time we experienced this, it was so dramatic that I can track four families that joined our church simply because of the biblical community that was evidenced by the people in that church towards Catherine and I. People that we knew who either were unchurched or nominally churched or going to other churches, they saw what was taking place in that church and it was so beautiful to them. They said, I want that, I need that. This last uh, fall in August and September, we had a, a number of funerals and at one of those funerals, well, really, every one of the funerals, I would say it was there, but one funeral in particular, somebody came up to me who was from out of town, and uh, they had observed the covenant group of the person who had lost the loved one. 
And they had observed how they had ministered to this family through really months and months of turmoil. They had loved them. They had fed them. They had carried them to doctors. They had just inter- interacted with them at the deepest, most practical points of life. And at that funeral, this person said, I have never seen something like this before. I've never seen a church like this before. If this church was in my town, I would at least visit this church. And I don't go to church. This was something from somebody who is not a believer saying, this is, this is neat. I need this. You see, unbelievers inherently know I need community. They're created for it. They're designed for it. They crave it, just like you crave it and need it. So when we lift before them, excuse me, <clears throat> when we lift before them a picture of biblical community, it is a winsome, powerful witness for Jesus Christ. How about this image? This is one I like. Dining room. The dining room table, right? Uh, what does that communicate to you? Besides, oh, I'm hungry, it's almost lunchtime. What does that communicate? What does that image communicate to you? What word? Just shout out a word. Yeah, several of you said it, fellowship, right? I mean, biblical community is supposed to be that place where we sit around the table. We sit, a lot of times we'll sit in a circle. Why? So we can look each other in the face and we can share our lives with one another. Our joys, our ambitions. This was a picture that was taken when a group of us got together and we started praying and talking about starting the Beachside Campus, which is going great, by the way. I mean, I mean we've, we've got just dozens of people coming and new people and we're, we're starting youth group and all kinds, of, it's going great. And, and a lot of it started around this dining room table right here. As we started sharing and dreaming what can be, and, and on a weekly basis, we need this type of interaction where we are fellowshipping with one another, making ourselves known to one another in a deep and a transparent way. Jesus says in verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Transparent oneness. A place where you feel like I can start letting the mask down. And don't be be foolish, don't be naive. You don't let all the mask down right away. It happens in layers. And sometimes what happens is it's within this type of community that you really click with the guy across the table. And maybe it's outside that group that you even go deeper in your transparency and accountability. But it starts right here and then it grows and it manifests itself in different ways. But biblical community is supposed to be a place where it's fun. Uh, Groups that I lead, it's going to include food. Okay, it just is. You know, Dina Stewart, who used to be here, the interim, Bob Stewart, Dina used to have a, a statement, statement, you know, food is love. <laughs> and there's just something that happens when a bunch of people get together and you all bring some food and you start eating and laughing and care, and you just enjoy life together. And then you begin to talk about Christ together and you enjoy Christ more together. Is it work? Yes. Is it inconvenient? Yes. Does that mean that somebody's going to have to clean their house in the middle of the week? Yep. (laughs) You know, unless you don't care. (laughs) So biblical community isn't easy, but it's necessary. Final image. How about this one? Calvary. Calvary. Verse 23, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. I have made known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. When a bunch of people get together in the name of Jesus and start doing life together, they begin to experience in deeper and deeper levels the the sacrificial, infinite, eternal love of Jesus Christ. As Jesus living in them, when we come together, we begin to experience that love in different ways. And this is why Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, how you love one 
another. How do you love? So for us in our church, biblical community is where you get support and care. It's where young moms have their needs addressed when they have a baby. And meals are brought and support is given while she recovers. It's where people who are facing medical crisis have people show up at the hospital to pray. You don't want me coming to the hospital to pray with you. That means you're dying. <laughs> no, Jerry, that's okay. I'm fine. It's just a, it's just a car. It's just, no, so go. It's just fine. I never forget that happened to Dan Landry a couple of years ago when he was in there and I happened to walk in and he sees me coming out. He goes, I'm okay, Jerry. I'm okay. Really? <laughs> I had just, he'd just been in there for a long time and I just thought I would stop in, but he, he knew that normally when I come, it's bad, right? I love the fact that Many of you, you have gone to the hospital at 7 o'clock in the morning for a procedure, and there were people from your covenant group to pray with you, to be there with you, to comfort you. And they had been praying with you for weeks, maybe even months ahead of time as you went through all those infernal testings and this and that, and they were there lifting your hands up. Got a letter a few weeks back from one of our members, and they've been members of this church, I guess, probably for 25 years at least, more than that, actually. And in that letter, they just relayed how the last couple of years have been some of the hardest years of their life. Job losses, major health issues, just one thing after another after another. <clears throat> and in this letter, she testifies of how precious her co covenant group was. What a blessing it was to her and her group. They couldn't imagine having gotten through the last several years if it were not for the support of those people that they meet with every Tuesday night and do a couple of hours of life together and they spend deep time in prayer for one another and how that has lifted them up and encouraged them and strengthened them. There is nobody in this room that does not need that in their life. Because without it, we're the zebra. Now look, it's not all peaches and cream, right? It's not, gonna, it's not perfect. You get people together, and there's going to be issues. Uh, I know it's hard to believe, but sometimes Christians are jerks. And you'll get in biblical community, and you'll have somebody that honestly, they don't just get on your last nerve, they camp there and they start pounding in stakes because they plan to stay a while. And even that is part of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Because becoming part like Christ is learning how to deal with Judas's. People who are ugly. Sometimes you get a leader who all you want to do is teach and talk, and you sit there for two hours of mind-numbing lecture. If that happens, you need to come tell us. <laughs> we'll work with that leader. It's not curriculum on life. It's not just a Bible study. We study the Bible in biblical community, but the purpose isn't to sit there for an hour and a half and listen to the teacher. That's not biblical community. Uh, sometimes people are going to come with mass. Sometimes you'll get in a biblical community and you'll shake your head because did we just pool our ignorance or what? That happens. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that uh, groups become inbred, <laughs> inward focused. And they refuse to, to serve together and reach out to others they just want it to be us three. They have such close fellowship. They don't even want new people from the church to come into the group because it will, it will upset the dynamic, much less an unbeliever coming into the group. That's not biblical community. That's self-centered fellowship. Self-centeredness. If you have a good community with one another, why wouldn't you want that to be given to somebody else if you have room in your group? That's selfish. And then you have people who refuse to let you in, keep you at arm's distance. It's not all peaches and cream. You, you, so for some of you, you've been to a group and you tried it and you said, no thanks, 
And the reason why is because you went to a group and it wasn't peaches and cream. There's, uh, you got sinners coming together into a room. Guess what's going to happen? There's going to be sin there at different times. That's part of biblical community where sin comes to the surface and it can be dealt with in gracious ways. Where people can actually be a sinner and not have somebody throw a stone at them. I, I, I frankly am uncomfortable in groups where people don't talk about their sin. They're not willing to put it out there. At least something that you're struggling with. I mean, are you that good of a Christian? If you are, I don't need to be here because I'm just going to drag you down. <laughs> we need this. Some of you, you've been to groups and you, you know, it didn't work out. Try again. Try to find a group that fits for you. Some of you, you've been to eight or nine or ten groups and it hasn't worked out. So you might want to look at yourself. Because <laughs> there's a common denominator here. It's you. But maybe God is using biblical community to show you that there's a problem with you. It needs to be addressed. As, hey, listen, I understand the fear. Some of you, uh, you know, a good number, but probably 65% of our church, you guys, you're in discipleship groups in a biblical community, but about a third of you aren't. And of the 65, we're not where we want to be in many of our groups. We're progressing, but we're not where we need to be. I want to encourage you, get in the biblical community. If you're not engaged in your bulletin, you can take it out. Look at it real quick. This little green sheet of paper. We're going to be taking the offering in just a moment. If you're not in biblical community, this little green sheet of paper is for you. We want to know where you are, okay? What do we need to do to help you get into biblical community? And so if you'll fill this out and drop it in the offering plate or at the close of the service back by the Covenant Connect table and booth, there's a big table and there's a lamp and, and Jonathan, and, who is our associate pastor in charge of biblical community in our church, Andrea Diener, his assistant, they're going to be back there and they can help you uh, learn what groups are available They'll take this from you and they'll see, if maybe they can put four or five of these together. There's four or five of you who need a group on Tuesday night in West Melbourne. Well, hey, there we go. But we won't know that you need that unless you fill that out. Now, look, don't, don't say, you know, yes, I want to be in biblical community. I'm available from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. every third Tuesday. Okay, you're making it impossible for us to help you, okay? So you got to meet us halfway. But fill this out and drop it in the offering plate or at the communication, at the Covenant Connect table. You also have in your bulletin a, uh, a listing of groups that are currently open, that people are looking for individuals who'd like to join. And there, there's details there, what night of the week and what part of the, of the uh, city that they're in and, and the county that they're in. And is it men only or women only or is it a mixed group? What is it? If you'll turn these things in and if you'll stop by and you'll see Jonathan and Andrew, we'll do everything we can to get you plugged into biblical community because you need it. The vision of our church is to help people be followers of Christ. Follow me. Who? Worship God passionately. And man, hearing just the worship this morning, the way you sing and you're lifting your voices to God. It's passionate worship. We want that on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings, but we want that for you Monday through Friday. Worship God passionately. And we want you to connect with God's people in biblical community so that you're impacting God's kingdom. So what we want to be as a church. But without biblical community, We'll get there. Because when we follow Jesus, we're to follow him together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at this passage. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be a church that grows deeper in our community. We have many great groups. And we'll have mediocre groups. We'll have great groups that sometimes will be mediocre and vice versa. But Father, help us within our discipleship groups to, to grow deeper with one another. Lord, give us people that we feel safe with so that we can take off masks, that we can be encouraged and exhorted by them, and in turn, we can do the same for them. Give us groups, Lord, that are strong in the Bible, studying it, learning who we are in Christ, and enjoying 
who we are in Christ together. And Father, most of all, make us a church filled with biblical community that is a light to those who don't know. And Lord, thank you for the groups that right now, they go out together, they serve together in local mission opportunities, whether it's the, the homeless or the hungry, or they might do evangelism together or whatever it may be. But Father, together they take seriously the charge to go and make disciples. And the best way to make disciples, Father, is to do it within the context of biblical community. May all of our groups be characterized not by a group of Christians who sit around getting fatter on the Word of God, but Christians who get fed by the Word of God and they grow stronger and then they go. We serve you and we pour our lives out before you so that your Son, Jesus, will be glorified through us and that men will be drawn to him. We ask these things in his name. Amen.